To begin a study of modern European history, we need to start in the later Middle Ages. This time period would have a profound effect on the formation of present-day Europe. 14th century Europe was an era of catastrophes. Some of them man-made, such as the Hundred Years' War, the Avignon Papacy, and the Great Schism. Other catastrophes were more or less natural disasters, any of which would have been sufficient to throw medieval Europe into a real Dark Ages, the Great Famine, and the Black Death. Each caused millions of deaths, and each in its own way demonstrated in dramatic fashion the existence of new vulnerabilities in Western European society. Together, they subjected the population of medieval Europe to tremendous strains, leading many people to challenge old institutions and doubt traditional values, and by doing so, these calamities altered the path of European development in many areas. From 1800 to 1300, the total population of Europe had increased steadily. Although there had been food shortages in which many people died of starvation, the standard of living in Western Europe as a whole had risen, even while the population had steadily increased. By the beginning of the 14th century, however, the population had grown to such an extent that the land could provide enough resources to support itself only under the best of conditions. There was no longer any margin for crop failures or even harvest shortfalls. At the same time, however, the Western European climate was undergoing a slight change, with cooler and wetter summers and earlier autumn storms. Conditions were no longer optimum for agriculture. There had been famines before, but none with such a large population to feed, and none that persisted for so long. A wet spring in the year 1315 made it impossible to plow all the fields that were ready for cultivation, and the heavy rains rotted some of the seed grain before it could germinate. The harvest was far smaller than usual, and the food reserves of many families were quickly depleted. People gathered what food they could from the forest, edible roots, plants, grasses, nuts, and bark. Although many people were badly weakened by malnutrition, the historical evidence suggests that relatively few actually died. The spring and summer of 1316 were wet and cold again, however. Peasant families now had less energy from which to till the land needed to harvest to make up for the previous shortfall, and possessed a much smaller food supply in reserve to sustain them until the next harvest. By the spring of 1317, all classes of society were suffering, although, as might be expected, the lower classes suffered the most. Draft animals were slaughtered, seed grain was eaten, infants and the young children were abandoned. Many of the elderly voluntarily starved themselves to death so that the younger members of the family might work to live and work in the fields again. There were numerous reports of cannibalism, although no one can tell if such talk was that or simply that of rumor mongering. The weather had returned to its normal pattern by the summer of 1317. But the people of Europe were incapable of making a quick recovery. An important factor in this situation was the scarcity of grain available to be used as seed. Although historians are still unsure of the validity of the figures, records of the time seem to indicate that a bushel, bushel of seed was needed in order to produce four bushels of wheat. At the height of the hunger in the late spring of 1317, starving people had eaten much of the grain normally set aside as seed, as well as many of their draft animals. Even so, any of the surviving people and animals were simply too weak to work effectively. About 10 to 15 percent of the population had died of pneumonia, bronchitis, tuberculosis, and other sicknesses that the starving sufferers' weaknesses had made fatal, and there were consequently few, fewer mouths to feed. It wasn't until about 1325 that the food supply had returned to a relatively normal state, and the population began to increase again. Europeans were badly shaken, however. The death rate had been high, and even nobles and clergy had perished from hunger. The world now seemed a less stable and gentle place than it had been before the Great Famine. During the next few years, the European economy slowly improved, and agricultural and manufacturing production eventually reached pre-famine levels. This return to normalcy was suddenly ended in the year 1347, by a disaster even worse than the Great Famine. This was the Black Death, or the Bubonic Plague. The Black Death seems to have arisen somewhere in Asia, and was brought to Europe from the Genoese trading station of Kaffa in the Crimea, part of the Black Sea. The story goes the Mongols were besieging Kaffa when a sickness broke out among their forces and compelled them to abandon the siege. 
As a parting shot, the Mongol commander loaded a few of the plague victims into his catapults and hurled them into the town. Some of the merchants left Kaffa for Constantinople as soon as the Mongols had departed, and they carried the plague with them. It spread from Constantinople along the trade routes, causing tremendous mortality along the way. So how was the Black Death transmitted? The three forms of the Black Death were transmitted two basic ways. Septicemic and bubonic plague were transmitted with direct contact with a flea, while pneumonic plague was transmitted through airborne droplets of saliva coughed up by bubonic or septicemic infected humans. The bubonic and septicemic plague were transmitted by the bite of an infected flea. Fleas, humans, and rats served as hosts for the disease. The bacteria, Yersinia pestis, multiplied inside the flea, blocking the flea's stomach, causing it to become famished. The flea would then start voraciously biting, biting a host. Since the feeding tube to the stomach was blocked, the flea was unable to satisfy its hunger. As a result, it continued to feed in a frenzy. During the feeding process, infected blood carrying the plague bacteria flowed into the human's wounds. The plague bacteria now had a new host, and the flea soon starved to death. The pneumonic plague was transmitted differently than the other two forms. It was transmitted through the droplets sprayed from the lungs and mouth of an infected person. And the droplets were the bacteria that caused the plague. The bacteria entered the lungs, the windpipe, and started attacking the lungs and throat. Eyewitnesses' account to the horror tell specifically what had gone on. October 1347, Sicily. Quote, Realizing what a deadly disaster had come to them, the people quickly drove the Italians from their city. But the disease remained, and soon death was everywhere. Fathers abandoned their sick sons. Lawyers refused to come and make out wills for the dying. Friars and nuns were left to care for the sick. And monasteries and convents were soon de deserted, as they too were stricken. Bodies were left in empty houses, and there was no one to give them a Christian burial." Unquote. The disease appeared in three forms, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. The plague lasted about a year in each area, but a third of a district's population would die during that period. People tried to protect themselves by carrying little bags filled with crushed herbs and flowers over their noses, but to little effect. Those individuals infected with bubonic would experience great swellings, or bubos, in the Latin of the times of their lymph gl glands and take to their beds. Those with septicemic would die quickly, before any obvious symptoms had appeared. Those with respiratory also died quickly, but not before developing evident symptoms. A sudden fever that turned their face a dark rose color, a sudden attack of sneezing followed by coughing, coughing up blood, and then death. From the Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, he tells the images of the Black Death. Quote, the plight of the lower and most of the middle classes was even more pitiful to behold. Most of them remained in their houses, either through poverty or in hopes of safety, and fell sick by the thousands. Since they received no care and attention, most, almost all of them died. Many ended their lives in the streets both at night and during the day, and many others who died in their houses were only known to be dead because their neighbors smelled their decaying bodies. Dead bodies filled every corner. Most of them were treated in the same manner by the survivors, who were more concerned to get rid of the bo rotting bodies than a move by charity towards the dead. With the aid of porters, if they could get them, they carried the bodies out of the houses and laid them at the door, where every morning quantities of the dead might be seen. Then they would be laid out on buyers, flat frame with wheels used in funerals, or, as these were often lacking, on tables." Unquote. In 1348, terrible earthquakes occurred in Italy. Compound with plague and scandals in the church intensified in the popular mind the feeling that all things would come to an end. With extraordinary suddenness, the companies of flagellants appeared and rapidly spread across the Alps through Hungary and Switzerland. In 1349, they'd reached Flanders, Holland, Bohemia, Poland, and Denmark. By September of that same year, they'd arrived in England, where, however, they were met with little success. All ages and conditions alike were subject to this mental epidemic. Clergy and la laity, men and women, even children, scourged themselves in reparation for the sins of the whole world. 
Great processions, amounting sometimes to 10,000 souls, pass through the cities, beating themselves and calling the faithful to repent. With crosses and banners borne before them by the clergy, they march slowly through the towns. Stripped to the waist and with covered faces, they scourge themselves with the leather tongs till the blood ran, chanting hymns of the Passion of Christ, entering the churches and prostrating themselves before the author, the altars. Outsiders were blamed, including populations that lived outside that of the Christian communities. In 1348, a trial of Jews at Chillon was supported by evidence extracted by torture. In Basel, all the Jews were pinned into wooden buildings and burned alive. Similar scenes occurred in Stuttgart, Ulm, Speyer, and Dresden. 2,000 Jews were massacred in Strasbourg, and Mainz as many as 12,000. Many fled to the Kingdom of Poland, where tolerance was much more prevalent. The disease finally played out in Scandinavia in about 1351, but another wave of the disease came in 1365, and several times after that until, for some unknown reason, the Black Death weakened and was replaced by waves of typhoid fever, typhus, or cholera. Europe continued to experience regular waves of such mortality until the 19th century. Although the bubonic plague is still endemic in many areas, including New Mexico and the American Southwest, it does not spread as it did of the Black Death of 1347-1351, nor was it as lethal. The social, economic, and political upheaval of the plague is often compared to the HIV-AIDS pandemic in Africa during the later half of the 20th century into the 21st century, in which adult infection rates were and are extremely high. Botswana and Lesotho are both at 23%. Life expectancy in some of these countries is only 46 years, where in the United States it's 79 years. The effects of that plague and its successors on men and women of medieval Europe were profound. New attitudes toward death, the value of life, and of oneself. It kindled a growth of class conflict, a loss of respect for the church, and the emergence of a new personal spirituality that profoundly altered European attitudes towards religion. Still, another effect, however, was to kindle a new cultural vigor in Europe, one in which natural languages, rather than Latin, were the vehicle of expression. Entire villages disappeared. The use of vernacular languages had increased. I've already spoken um, and read some quotes from Giovanna Boccaccio's The Decameron. Um, the Decameron was a Latin of tales written in 1350 and set in a country house where a group of noble young men and women in Florence have fled to escape the plague raging in the city. The church and nobility lost both people and prestige because nobody was safe from the plague. And finally, monarchs continue to move towards more centralized governments and economies. And we'll see that most notably when we take a look at England, France, and Spain. Uh, we'll talk about England and France in the next lecture. Thank you very much.